Are you recording already? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So. Thanks for talking to us. So. Okay. <laughs> um, Ami said, you, um, I should talk to you because um, you're, you're quite known in the neighborhood here. So that means you probably live here for a long time? Yeah. How many years? Um, I've lived in Liverpool for 50 years. 50? 50 years. So 5-0? Five 5-0. Zero. Five zero. All the time here in, in this No, I was, I was born in Jamaica, but I yeah. came here when I was a baby, about 12 months old. Alright, so you have no um, recollection whatsoever of Jamaica, or did you go back? I've been back, yeah. Yeah. And, and your parents told you a lot about Jamaica? Yeah, yeah. obviously. Well, you want to go back still now? Or? Yeah, I still want to go back. It's yeah. a beautiful place. Yeah. And because I'm obviously westernized, I can see yeah. the benefit of living in the West, education, yeah. monetary things, that some things that I don't have there. Yeah. At some point, I'd like to be able to go home and say home and do something positive and constructive with myself. Yeah. I'm an artist as well. Yeah. And I'm a photographer and a painter and a writer. So one day I want to take my artwork and my photography from Liverpool to Jamaica and exhibit it there and kind of show them the life, my diary of my life here. Okay, so to, and to, to show what, what, what it is like as, as in Jamaican to be yeah. in, to be raised in, in like in, Liverpool. In, yeah, but equally to take pictures of Jamaica and bring them back and show people yeah. in Liverpool the this difference. Is the difference between there and there. Yeah. Uh, especially for some of the young people, it would be good for them to see, for them to appreciate how lucky they are and how well off they are here and the opportunities that they've got here. Yeah. Uh, if they were in other places, they wouldn't have those opportunities. Do you think sometimes that, that people who live here don't realize uh, enough that they, what well, they have? What I tend to find is the people who come here from other places tend to excel more and take advantage more of the opportunities because they realize where they came from and how affluent it is here. Yeah. But uh, some of the people who were born here just take things for granted. So they've got PlayStation, they've got designer yeah. clothes, they go out, they, they party, they do whatever they want to do, but they don't really appreciate because they've never been anywhere else or seen where they come from or where their families come from to understand. So, so that's what I find that, yeah, yeah. people who come from other places tend to take more advantage and make more progress than the people who are born here because the people who are born here just take everything for granted. Yeah. Is it, uh, what, what uh, would you kind of take from, from this society towards uh, to Jamaica? What is, is there something that you would say definitely this they should install in Jamaica too? Like Well, the thing about Liverpool and Jamaica and any of those Caribbean, North or South American uh, places is that Liverpool used to be the factory for slavery when Britain was involved yeah. in the slave trade. So Liverpool was the place where the ships went from. They went to Africa, traded broken mirrors and rusty cutlass and gin for human beings and took them across the Atlantic to America and then brought back cotton and sugar and molasses from the Caribbean. Yeah. So Liverpool has gone through a Holocaust type experience. I always say all the gravestones, all the paving stones in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. They're like gravestones for people who didn't make it in that triangle journey. For those people who were captured, who didn't make it across the ocean, whose DNA went out of the, the gene pool due to that kind of a thing. So the one thing Liverpool, I think, has learned is that truly intoxicated. We do live like the family of man. You'll go from door to door in the street and you'll find there's people from Caribbean, people from Africa, people from South America, people from Asia, people from China. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in Toxic there's a Australian Native American, uh, Native Aboriginal person yeah. here because everyone is here. So we live like the family of man here. And yeah. There's one thing I would reckon to say, take anywhere else, is to learn that human beings need to live together as a family and like the family of humanity. And I think that's one thing I'd take from Liverpool. Yeah. Anywhere in the world, not just Jamaica. No, it's, uh, I've walked the streets a little bit here, and then um, what I realize is a lot of people talking about talks are very positive, yeah. like the way they live, etc. Yeah. Although there's also a negative image because of the riots, and then, but if you're here, it's very positive. Well, as I said, it's like anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. gossip, slander, 
people throw shit, some of it will stick. It doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that the person who it sticks to is the dirty one. But yeah, people throw shit and it sticks. And obviously, since 1981, the community has been exposed to negative media uh, propaganda. Liverpool as well, but Toxler particularly gets it because it's a mixed race and multicultural community. So some people like to point the finger to say, oh, multiculturalism, multi-diversity, people living together, it doesn't work. But so they've got their own vested interests. If you live here and you live in other parts of Liverpool, you can see the difference. This is the cosmopolitan world centre in the city. Yeah. Other places, it's quite redneck and racist and exclusive. For me to go to certain areas, I know I wouldn't be welcome. I would get funny looks, I would mm. get strange comments. But because I've lived here that long, when I speak, they quickly realise, oh, you're like one of us, aren't you? And I say, mm. yeah, I'm like one of you. And often, I'm older than you. So I've been being a scouser longer than you. Yeah. Even though my family may have come from somewhere else. All my brothers and sisters are born here. I'm the only one. Yeah. But I'm a scouse Jamaican. Yeah. You know I mean? w were you here also um, in Toxic for like like a long time? Like Yeah, I've lived here always since yeah. I came. We've always lived in Liverpool. And I've always lived in Toxic. I've lived yeah. other places in the UK, but... Liverpool is my home. Yeah, is it, did it change a lot, like top? Because I see now here on the other side, there's a lot of like changing the houses, etc. Well, what you mentioned, you mentioned the riots of 1981. Yeah, and I think one of the policies of the people in power at the time, because they saw the unity amongst the people, was to divide the people. So people got moved out, things got moved around, shops were allowed to go vacant certain homes were allowed to just be run down because it was all part and parcel of breaking up a positive, unified community. Mm -hmm. And how do they do it? I mean, um, is this power, they, is it like neglect or is it more like they actively try to, to change things? Well, neglect and actively working against people can be just as effective. Yeah. And that's why I said Definitely. after 1981, one of the things that changed in the community was that suddenly we were exposed to a lot of Class A drugs and chemicals. Yeah. So to me, it's felt like since 1981, there's been a chemical warfare on in this community and other communities, black, multicultural communities across the country, where as part of the divide and rule, suddenly Class A drugs are there. And so instead of being unified, people start to fight yeah. and scrabble after little bits of rock and powder. Is it, is it something that um, you would say that is... Um kind of a regret for, for the rights that it happened because of that afterwards it, it got worse or? Well as I said, when these people do what they do, they don't turn up in a bowl of hat and say we'd like to contaminate your streets. We have different associations and lodges and different places where different people meet. And so if they want to do something in a community like this, they can find bodies on the streets who'll be willing to sell their community out for pennies or riches mm -hmm. and things can occur but as I said no one envisages 20 years later when you see junkies people looking malnourished desperados people who will commit bad criminal acts to try and get money for drugs these yeah. are the things that people don't see originally when they start getting involved with stuff like that yeah and, and um when the the rights just before the rights was it that hard to live here uh, that that because people came on the streets no, again, as I said, because of Liverpool's history, there's always been a black community here for 250, 300 years. So it's all, black people in this city have always been second and third class citizens. At one time, you would go places and there would be signs, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, no pets. So a certain section of people were like, herded together in a ghetto. Yeah. And now Europeans, because of history, understand the meaning of a ghetto when people are segregated and are pointed out and marked out as being somewhat different from the mainstream. They're easy targets to attack, yeah. easy targets to blame. They very rarely have much political voice and they have very rarely have much financial power. Yeah. But when they do come together collectively as anybody, they can affect things and that's what happened in Toxic. People came together and affected things. We weren't necessarily ready for what was going to come afterwards, but sometimes mm -hmm. things have to change. I always liken Toxic to a battered wife 
is being continually abused by an aggressive male. Eventually, other people whisper and say to him, well, you, you, you have to do something about it. But nobody gets involved until the day the wife stands up for herself. Yep. And then suddenly she finds herself in court and she's accused of vicious, violent crimes against this man. But in reality, she's been the victim for 20 years, but now she's just fought back. And Toxic was a bit like that. We've been the victims for many, many, many years. And we just fought back because we'd had enough. Yeah. And what was the... Because I, I'm not really um, aware of that time, but what was like the, the set-off of the, of the riots then? It was just like one day something happened or...? No, and I said, it's a process that happens over years yeah. and years yeah. and years. So years and years of police harassment, years and years of bad housing, years and years of educational failure, years and years of being neglected by the establishment and being forced into a corner, eventually, yeah. you know. It needs a little spark. It needs, it needs a little spark, drip, drip. And so eventually there was a spark, but the atmosphere, it's like petrol in the, in the air. It just needed a spark because, yeah. I said, the history of the place and how much people have been through. Yeah, but now you have this community who's like, I've seen uh, the other street and then they're kind of really, really hanging together and, and fight for, for their own place. That's really good. Well, because we're the last few people, that's why I said everything's changed. Where one time you could go along Princess Avenue, Huskisson Street, those homes were pretty run down and derelict. But you know, in the last 10, 15 years, they've been regenerated, yeah. they've been gentrified, and now a flat on Princess Avenue is £100,000, £150,000. The local people can't afford to mm -hmm. live there. There's a, a number of streets called the Well Streets across the other side of the avenue they're going to knock those down but these are like terraced houses mm -hmm. that have been allowed to go to waste i can't understand why they don't organize a project to get young people working on those houses learning building skills doing them up and then at the same time give those same young people in the community the opportunity to get onto the housing market to buy that property yeah and things of this nature and i'm just a guy in the back street is it like this house, you own this house? Or no, I rent this house. Is this also kind of a social house that you rent cheaper for? How does no, it work this, here? This, no, this is a private landlord. Yeah, and that, that works out fine. I mean, like, this, is it more expensive or...? I'm industrious and I'm enterprising. Yeah. As right. I said, I'm an artist, so yeah. artists always find a way. They do. <laughs> I definitely agree. One of the first questions we ask is, um, if you, I'm going to check if the sound is all right. Sounds. Can you say something just for a second? Uh, uh, umpty dumpty fell off the wall. <laughs> so I'm told. <laughs> um, it's good. Have you noticed something about fairy tales? They're quite scary. Dark, aren't they? They are. You know. Yeah. You got well, like goosey goosey gander. Yeah, I don't know who wrote these things. They frighten the kids. Isn't it like that they were made for, for kids to be scared of, so they, they could, yeah. this kind of moral... Uh, very uh, dark, because you've got one there, which is uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Yeah. Now, Snow White dies, so along comes the prince, good-looking guy, yeah. and kisses a, uh, a dead body, which is necrophilia, <laughs> isn't it? I've never it's thought about it in that, that so deep. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Strange, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and you've got another one who's, who's in the back kitchen all the time, holding on to this shoe, hoping that some guy will come along and take it away. As if with a, a fetish, a shoe fetish? Yeah, Cinderella. Yeah. <laughs> There's strange people in, in those fairy tales. Do you have a favourite? Do oh, I have a favourite? You know what? I was, when I was a child, I was brought up in an orphanage school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, four years I spent in there. It was quite tough, to be honest with you. It was a, it was a Catholic institution mm -hmm. run by Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> They're very good at lashing you, giving you a crack over the head. And really? You've got these big long straps, leather, and uh, you could always smell. Used to, I think they, they must have used sort of uh, saddle wax on them. Yeah. And uh, when they'd give you a good belt with them be full of your DNA all over them. And uh, <laughs> how old were you then? Four to eight. Four to eight. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And so that probably had a big influence on... on well, of course, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what the influence really was. I'm quite well aware I was poor. That was one influence. Yeah. Uh, I'm quite well aware that... Uh, I used to have this... used to look out the window, because right opposite was the, a girls' school, uh, a private school. Uh, this is 1954 to 58. Yeah. 59. And right opposite was a girls' school. And in the summer, all these girls had walked past, sort of with big bloater store hats on, lovely uniforms and leather straps. And you'd have like a nun in the front, a nun at the behind, and two either side. And they'd walk really upright. Mm. Walk out the window, go, oh, that's what Wales that they belong to, because it's not the world I belong to. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. And I was speaking to an old lady not so long ago, and she actually went there. And she said she lived in uh, Crosby or somewhere, in the just after the war, first world, second world war, and uh, her dad used to take it in the car. Well, where I live, we didn't have cars. Yeah. The only person that pulled up in the car was maybe sometimes a doctor or a priest, and that was it. Yeah. I mean, uh, TV we didn't have television as such, you know, until it was about ten, eleven. And then what kind of house did you live in in just those days? Council house. My parents had come. If you get, my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents from Irish stock, and they come over from about 1849 onwards, mm. the Great Potato Famine in Ireland. Where, if you look at it, what was happening there, Ireland became part of the United Kingdom in 1801. So it's part of the country, yet the establishment let these people starve to death while they were exporting grain from Dublin. And they, they just they tried to anglicise Ireland because they, the the uh, the Romans never got to Ireland, mm -hmm. so it was very Celtic religion. I think it was Pope Gregory the Third or someone one of them. He said to Edward the Second, "Get over there and sort them heathens out." So they went over and Angl Anglis tried to anglicise, but they never moved far. They stayed in Dublin, which was part of which was like a fortress. And anywhere beyond that, they called Beyond the Pale. It's an Irish saying, Beyond the Pale. So anyone who lived beyond there, lived beyond the Pale. The land was called the Pale, you such, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, I have great affinity to Ireland, because yeah. obviously, you know where you come from, your roots, you've got you to really remember that. No uh, where uh, you go to. Is this something that your parents also kind of uh, uh, taught you? Well, the religion yeah. part, because we were Catholics, mm. very devout Catholics. That comes with being Irish. Yeah. Is, is this like in Liverpool um, a big difference between between being a, a Catholic and a Protestant? Oh yeah, huge difference. Yeah. At one stage, I mean, there might have been a bigotry going on, sort of. Uh, uh, it was part of, I think, I might be wrong there, but I think I'm right. There was a brewery called Stanhope Street, yes, mm -hmm. up in Stanhope Street, Higgins, and they wouldn't employ Catholics. Really? And this is the 50s, and then he was... In Northern Ireland, it was Holland and Wolf that, that built the Titanic. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they had 10,000 workers, and out of them was about 400 Catholics, and they all they would be doing would be cleaning up the shit houses. That was their job. Catholics were disenfranchised in yeah. Northern Ireland. Didn't have a right to vote, didn't have a right for nothing. The dog had a better, which suited better than Catholics. Well, what's the history with the Titanic in Liverpool? Uh, well, it's a big history because uh, if you go back to the White Star Line, which, which was founded, which was, then became Canard Line, which was the, the Titanic, you know, mm -hmm. Canard. They built the Titanic. But they built it in, uh, in Belfast, and its number, it had a number, right? Mm -hmm. And that number on it, whatever the ship's number was originally, if you link that to letters of the alphabet, do you know what it said? Yeah, no. No popery. What? No? No popery. What does that mean? It's a derogatory word for the Pope. Really? Yeah. No popery. <laughs> and Captain Smith, who was the captain of the Titanic, he made a statement that said that God couldn't sink this ship. Oops. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, there you so, go. So, uh, yeah, of course, yeah. And we, and, and again, uh, religion has a big impact or had a big impact on the city living because when you came over you know after 40, 1849 people were starving in, I mean in, I don't know if you've been to Ireland but they've got these huge big famine fields what they call famine 
and literally died, you know, in the fields yeah. of starvation. How was it for you? Because um, the, the 50s for you, it was a kind of a pool uh, when you were a child, but now a lot has changed. Well, God, yeah, thank God things have changed. But, and then they haven't, because I was at a... I went to a community centre last week, and, uh, and I noticed there was a, a sort of leaflet there, and I'm uh, collecting for food for, for families who are struggling today. Yeah. And that sort of hurt me to think, God, you know, I'm 61 years of age, and where, where have we gone? Where is still, still people living in abject poverty. I mean, it might be a different form of poverty. Mm -hmm. They might have the plasma TVs. They might have... Uh, Maybe in some cases they might have better housing conditions, which they have. But poverty covers a lot of things. For example, I want to go to Bali in Covent Garden. I can't afford to pay 150, 200 pounds for the seat. So I'm denied that because of me, me poverty. Do you know what yes. I'm saying? So I might go, I might, my choices are limited. I'll go to Primark instead of John Lewis's. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So poverty is still relevant today. Children are going to school hungry now today, as they were when I was going to school. Uh, children are going to school with uh, not in the winter's coming on, not proper uh, clothing to wear. It's 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 a it's a sin if you believe in religion. I mean, mm -hmm. and these people profess to believe in religion. These are the people who are so-called Christians, you know, who, who follow the carpenter's son. And what he said on the Sermon of the Mount, love thy neighbour, you know, and all this. Well, you were brought up as a Catholic? Oh, yeah. And, and are you still a Catholic? I'm still a Catholic, yeah. yeah. You still... It's a little seed they plant in you. Yeah. And it's very difficult. But, you know, when I was brought up as a Catholic, I, 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 I knew that, I mean, I, had a, I could read that catechism backwards. You know, mm. uh, if I had a wallet as thick as it, I'd be a very, very rich man. But you know what I'm saying? It was, it was just part of fashion, bang, bang, bang. It was banged into it or drummed into it. Mm -hmm. So religion, yeah, you can't get away from it. It's just, but obviously, you know, you don't ask questions. And then later on in life, you ask questions. You, you start to think, well, is that right? How can that be right? That doesn't sound right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So well, I, I, I like lots of things. I read, I'm an avid reader. I mean, I, I love the philosophers, I love their way, you know. What are you reading now? I'm reading actually about the House of Wisdom. And what it's about is uh, the First Crusade, a guy named Peter, the Peter, I think it was First or Second Crusade, Peter the Hermit. I mean, he, he Pope Urban II, he sort of instigated this huge campaign against Islam mm -hmm. because there was so much going on in Europe. These warring factions of princes and kings had each other's throats, and to unite them, he thought, well, we'll get a common enemy, which is Islam. So this guy picks up the, the gauntlet, this Peter uh, the Hermit, on a donkey, and he rides to Constantinople. And on the way, he's, he's getting all thousands and thousands of followers, you know, to go there. And this is the dark ages in this country where belief belief uh, re, there was no there was no reason it was only belief Christianity it smothered the movements we, we didn't move any it didn't go further whereas in the Arab world they they they, they you know where, where, they, they knew how to chart the stars they can circum uh, they, they they could measure the earth they could tell the time when Peter the uh, Peter the Hermit knocked on the door, Constantinople. He didn't even know what day it was or what time it was. <laughs> he was going to conquer them. But they massacred them. They went on to Jerusalem. Mm. And they, you know, for, for sort of uh, retribution, because they, the Jews and the Arabs, and, well, mostly Jews, and they, they, they were the ones who, uh, who killed Christ. So it's mm. your turn now, you know. These are, these are so called, if, you know, they believe in Christ as. Is following, but you, you don't do things like that. Do it's clear that you you you're um, you're interested in history. Uh, well, so history is a great indicator and a great measure of where we are today. You're mm -hmm. not going to like. I believe in like this. Yeah, I think it was Aristotle or Plato said. There's no concept of time. It's a, uh, there's no there's no thing as uh, such thing as time because it's composed. 
of the past and the future. The past is long gone and the future is not here yet. Right. Mm -hmm. So I live for now, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you That's very my much. History. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the conversation. Yeah, hope you've uh, been okay. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> I think uh, I'll probably get burnt at the stake now. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why are you actually a volunteer here in, in the well, Blue Cups? I love the arts. Mm -hmm. I love the theatre. I love to read. I've just started. I mean, would you believe it? Uh, I'm 61 years of age, and I've just got a place at university. You so so that means you go and start studying I'm now. I'm a student. Yeah, yeah and yeah, wh wh I'm what's your? Yeah, to get me fifteen percent discount on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you the story. I don't want you to put this down. <laughs> well, I you know. I, I mean, I used to pass the university. I worked yeah. on the docks all my life. With my yeah. dad, we were family of dockers, and on the dock was the docks. The docks was a hot bed. I mean, you can put this down hotbed of political activity. Mm. I mean, it, that's the way it was because of the culture of Liverpool. I mean, you have, we used to have these big mass meetings. When I was a kid, my dad was a socialist. He used to take me to the stadium and he'd go to all these big mass meetings and lots of people about like, you know, and you'd always get half a crown. Someone would give you half a crown, which was a lot of money, you know what I mean? It's a lot of yep. money, like. So when I started on the dock, I mean, uh, you go to these meetings, like, huge mass meetings and all in the front you'd have different fractions you'd have like Maoists you'd have Leninists you'd have Trotskyites yes you'd have this and it'd all be at each other's throats you know <laughs> <laughs> and it was really but you like I, I I met my mentor there he, he gave me my first book I ever read because I, I couldn't read I could hardly read or write when I left school and I got on a month on a I left on a Friday and I was working on the Monday and I was like into the big world of of work and I had to like pull back I, I couldn't express myself because I was frightened of getting caught out because I, I couldn't I could hardly read you know I could hardly read the yeah. right all the years at school never learned nothing because things was happening and mud wasn't well and things like that and again what happened my first introduction to the school when I left this orphanage school which I was I used to go there every morning to the orphanage school with my sister I was in a secondary modern school that was a tough school in a tough area. And uh, my first introduction to maths was a maths teacher, and I won't mention his name. Uh, and he put a ruler down in front of me. I was eight. I was an emaciated little chap. There were 40 kids in the class, and he stood behind me and he said, Hey, son, point an inch out of that ruler. Well, he might as well put a fork there. As far as I'm aware, I didn't even know what it was. I'd never seen a ruler. Mm -hmm. He said, son, point an inch out. I said, I can't say it. Well, he got me. He just went bang, hit me the back of the head. And he nearly took my head off. And from that day on, I was petrified of basically maths. I just drew back, drew back, and drew back. And that was my experience and my sort of, uh, how can you put it, uh, my baptism. And it... It never left me that. It's never yeah. left me all these years. It's upset me sometimes. And it's now you're here. Uh, I'm here. I'm at university. I've gone yeah. a long, long way. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And what are your subjects? Well, what it is, it's called a Go Higher course. And I'm, well, I, I find myself wanting to get on it because of my age and because, mm. you know, because uh, I don't know. Obviously, no one knows what the future is. I don't know what the future is. I only live for now, but I thought, you know, when I went, I got an opportunity to, to get on this course, and I've been accepted, and uh, I'm quite happy with that, because I had to do, like, a, a sort of uh, assessment mm. up at the university, and it was good. They said, yeah, you're at the level we want, come in. Great. But, but uh, with a lot of young people, which is, I am finding a bit difficult, because, obviously, they might see me as some sort of dinosaur or something, you know. No, they don't actually. I, I, <laughs> when I was a young kid, um, I studied philosophy and there was um, also um, an old man in, in the course and I thought that was really, really mm. good for, for, mm. for the talks because then you had this kind of 
you know, young kids when they're amongst mm. each other, they think yeah. they can change. But then you have this other level yeah. that that shows you there's another world also going well, I mean, on. Well, you know, last year I was I was going up. Uh, I think it was Harbour Street, and all these uh, graduates come out with the cap and gown on and stuff. You know, and mm. I thought, you know, God, I, I wish I'd have had the opportunity to do that. But it never had. It wasn't for those my family, people like me, working class people. You know, it wasn't. Education wasn't an issue because my parents weren't educated. My mother was very clever. But again, you know, just. Mm. But you've been wor working uh, at the docks until w what age? Until I was about forty. Then I had a breakdown. Yeah. And what happened then to you? I mean, well, my life totally changed. Mm. My life just turned upside down. You know, uh, it was hard for me. Uh, I was hospitalised. Was it like you you got unemployed and? Well, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't work, you see, because of my illness. But then it, 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 it stuck on to me because I'd been, I'd been, if you want to call it, programmed to work. And um, I used to get up in the morning, put my working clothes on, and get back into bed. Yeah. And climb the walls. I was ill. You know. Yeah, it, was it like you had a depression? Depression, yeah. Yeah. And I was ill, and uh, it's even like things you know you you think well, uh, like say the alarm clock for example. I mean, even that I used to set the alarm clock, but knowing I wasn't getting enough for work, as I couldn't work, but I, w I couldn't accept that. Yeah. And I became isolated because once you're not working, you, you, the phone doesn't ring anymore. Your friends don't phone after a while. You go into a I don't drink really as such. You go into a, a pub or somewhere around Christmas time and everyone's out with Christmas hats on having a party. Work, workmates get together, you have a Christmas dinner and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting on your own, you're isolated. And you feel it, you know, you feel that isolation. It really yeah. hurts, it really hurts. And I tried to get back into work, but my illness is always, you know, it's just, just yeah. come up and have problems. So this, this to me is is good for me, you know. Gets me out the house. Yeah. I, I like the arts, as I say. I go to theatre. I like I like anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like it gives me chance to, re to catch up to me reading. Yeah. Stuff, meet people. Oh God! I had a spot on TV. Yeah. Anything at all. Mm. Oh, that's really really difficult question. Well, you could sort of interpret uh, it as you know what interests you or what do you feel like. Oh God. Can I think about it and come back to the next? Uh, can I answer the next question? And yeah, it's not one? really a set of questions. We're just sort of you know trying to find out what interests people, like what people would like to talk about, you know, and those kind of things. I mean, maybe music, I suppose, possibly. Yeah. Are you do you work in music yourself? Oh God, or? no. No, <laughs> I just listen to it occasionally. You just listen to it. Okay. What bands yeah. do you like? Uh, I sort of I like Wilco. I like sort of American music. Oh right. Okay. That sort of stuff. Like modern stuff or stuff you More know. More modern, I'd say, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. I'm the kind of person who basically still likes all the stuff that I died liked, you know, like the Clash and Joy Division. I, I know I can do a bit of that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what do you, what industry do you work in? Uh, I work for BT, British Telecom. Oh, right. But I'm a union rep for that, uh, so I don't actually do any, work, any normal work for BT. I just sort of, uh, represent right. people in the workplace, that sort of thing. Which union is that? Communication Workers Union. Oh, right, okay. That's not PCS? No. Right. Okay, so have you had a sort of lot of a uh, problem with <laughs> workers' disputes at the moment, just in the current um, like sort of climate? Uh, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, maybe there's been a bit of an increase in it because of the because um, of the economic downturn. I think might have put some pressure on businesses. Yeah. Do you ever get like? I mean, do you think your union's sort of an effective one, or do you get a bit frustrated? See, this is what I would talk about. Yeah, there you go. See, <laughs> see how I've you know, got you. See what you've done there. <laughs> talk about my job. How oh, boring. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I think. I mean, I just think like, especially at the moment in the current economic climate, you know, the sort of actions of unions are definitely something that's, you know, whether they do enough, whether they do too much, and everyone's got a different opinion on it. Yeah. Well, it, it's a bit of a, an opportunity, possibly at the moment, with the current government. Mm. I mean, you know, what what can I say about them? <laughs> I don't know. What would you like to say? I'm not going to push you. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> I would love this. to get you started. Come on. If you were on, had a TV spot and you had to talk about the, uh, the condemned government, as they like to call it, what would you talk, what would you say about them? I, I just do not think that they've got working people's interests at heart at all. Mm. I think they're self-serving. Uh, I think they're elitist. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say how <laughs> You worry that we'll have it'll to just, edit no, it out because of expletives. Yeah, it'll just turn into a rant, that's yeah. why, okay. Oh, okay. Well, I'm a sort of a perpetual ranter myself, so I have to yeah, say, yeah. I do sympathise with that a lot. But, um, I mean, do you think there's anything that, I mean, you talk about that they don't have workers, you know, interests at heart and stuff, so it's kind of, I mean, obviously that's traditionally the role of a union, to represent those interests. Yeah. I mean, do you I feel think, that... I genuinely think the people in this country settle for too less, for too little in the workplace, and they sort of feel very, they feel privileged to have been given a job in the first place. Yeah. And I think that our mindset needs to change there, that, you know, we're working for a company and the company isn't really working for us as such. So, um, they're yeah. profiting by us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're profiting yeah. from the work that you do. You know? yeah. I'm going to sound like a real left wing loony, aren't I? I'm quite careful. <laughs> I'm a left wing loony, so. <laughs> I like left wing loonies. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think that's true. I think that that mindset is really prevalent in this country. You know, people are too, too worried to kick up a fuss and to fight for their rights. And that goes right across, um, right across the, sort of the, um, a lot of working, a lot of um, sectors in this country. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so do you think that they will be able to do anything about it, or do you think they're kind of going to be, just going to be with um, the 80s, you know, like where you sort of get a bit crushed by? I, I don't know. I think, I think we'll have to see, to be honest. I don't know if I can really predict yeah. that. I mean, there's a few pro there's a protests coming up, isn't there, in October, down in London, which is following on from the previous TUC protests that yeah. happened. So um, we'll see what comes of that. Are you going to go down for that? Uh, yeah, I am. I mean, you know, I went to the, to the last one, and um, it was noticeable that the people that were at that protest were not your necessarily your staunch left-wing people. They were sort of families. There were a lot of sort of lower middle class people and professional people that were, that were down there as well. So mm. I think that was a real sign of the times, you know. I think if you're the government and you're losing those people, then you're, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. So how do you think the next election is going to go then in, in light of that? Oh, God. I, 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 mean, I really hope we kick the Tories out. <laughs> By we, yeah. do you mean Labour? I mean, I mean, us, us here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I think, yeah, I think, I think Labour will kick them out, yeah. yeah. God, I hope so, I hate them. But do you think Labour are sort of particularly effective at the moment, you know, and what, like, what uh, do you think about Ed Miliband, for example? <laughs> I don't really know enough about Ed Miliband. I don't, mm. I don't, he doesn't seem to be getting an awful lot of coverage at the moment. Um, I don't know if he's doing the most effective job uh, that he could be doing. <laughs> have you always think, worked in Liverpool? Are you, are you from Liverpool? Uh, I'm, from, I'm from the Wirral originally. Then I've worked. Um, I've, I live in Germany. I went to university in Scotland. And I've lived and worked in the Midlands. <laughs> and now I've come back to Liverpool. So I've been here for another about, been here for about five years now. I think. Oh, right. Okay. And do you like living here? Yeah, yeah. I love living here, yeah. What do you like about it particularly? Uh, Liverpool's quite a small, compact city with a lot going on for its size. Mm. Um, so there's always like stuff like this, for instance, is, you know, it's quite regular. So it's, it, yeah, it's good. I always think it's kind of like a big village. You know, you even though it's a city, you go into town and you're likely to see someone that you know and who knows, yeah, someone, true, who knows yeah. someone who knows someone that you know. <laughs> it's one of those. Yeah, you're right. I think if you, if you stay in the city for long enough, you, you do get that feeling there. Yeah, you do come to people the same, you know, especially if you go to the same places as well. You yeah. bump into the same people. So. so you say you worked in Germany. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. Um, well, my, my girlfriend at the time was German, so I went over to live in Germany. And... Um, I worked in a university and I worked in a hotel. Oh, okay. What yeah. were you doing in, at a university? And I was work in the university. It was a long time ago, right? I was working on soil science. Right. And um, you know, yeah, it's a big field. Different That's no from pun intended. BT, anyway. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and in a hotel, I moved around tables and chairs. Okay. And which yeah. was the more interesting of the two? Do you think? Uh, well, the tables and chairs was more interesting than you might think because it gave me a good opportunity to learn German. So. Right. Okay. I like simple stuff like five rows of chairs. And, you know, four deep. Yeah. <laughs> Simple maths in a, in a foreign language can become quite challenging. Yeah. Whereabouts so. in Germany, where? Uh, Braunschweig, is which is sort of oh. north Germany near Hanover. Oh, okay. I've only been to Trier, you know, which is like. I have no uh, idea where that is. It's, like, it's actually where Karl Marx is from, <laughs> speaking of. Oh, okay. <laughs> like all right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. yeah, it's like an old Roman fort. It's kind of a bit like Bath, you know, like old sure, Roman yeah. city. But um, I did German GCSE and I was pretty terrible at it. I yeah, like yeah, French I, better. <laughs> I've got no, no natural talent for language whatsoever. Do you still speak it? I can speak a little bit still, yeah. Why don't you say an opinion about the government in German? I abs <laughs> no, no, I absolutely couldn't. It was hard enough saying it in English, let alone in German. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say anything in German. I can, I can, yeah. Don't put me on the spot. I'm going to get embarrassed. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so was the soil science thing, was that like a research job? Yeah, I was, helping out, um, I was helping out a a doctor in the university and he gave me a little he gave me a little job which is really good because I'm short of money as well so he gave me like a little contract 
and give me some data to work on and stuff like that. So that's so just say you've done a wide variety of yeah, I suppose so, yeah. work then. Yeah, I've done quite a lot of dishwashing as a student as well. <laughs> That's always good. good. <laughs> yeah. And do you imagine that you'd stay in Liverpool for quite a while, or do you feel it's quite a temporary situation? Um, no, no, I think I'll stay here for a bit. Yeah. yeah. It's drawing you in. Yeah, well, my <laughs> friends and family live here as well, so. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's good. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time. Hiya. Nice Hi. To you. I'm Beth. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, um, yeah, what, what are you just gardening here then? I know just. Yeah, um, we're, I'm sort of volunteering here, and it's a project about um, sort of getting people involved, um, adults with learning disabilities. Oh, right. And it's okay. about um, sort of, well, we sort of re redesigned like the, the, the Blue Coat Garden. So it's sort of like art through gardening. Right, but so like you, you're counting this as an art project? Yeah, then? I think so. I mean, I am. <laughs> like, um, I came into it kind of late because I was, um, I've only been here for the summer. But, um, but yeah, basically, like, it's all been redesigned. Um, but, you know, because it's like an outside space, so it's all about yeah. sort of getting the community involved kind of thing, so. Right, okay, so you've when you say redesign like i know that they've redesigned the old blue coat but do you mean the actual like plant spaces yeah so like you've... these beds have all been like emptied out and like we've put new things in it's not kind of about like sensations like this is like time we'll be growing here so it'll oh, be like right, okay. it'll smell nice and yeah. look nice and you know yeah just sort of be something that i don't know a bit different to what it was before which was just sort of like pretty but now it's kind of like supposed to be all inclusive kind of thing right sense touch yeah taste, yeah, yeah. you know like what that. i mean yeah so is it mainly is it more herbs than flowers that you're putting in then no no it's just like this this one that i've been working on all day is basically just herbs so right. it's kind of like and they, are they going to be used then for I think, I don't seasoning know, I think so. maybe but then there might be the whole health and safety problems of them being uh, like oh, no yeah. but poisoning people with time yeah exactly <laughs> i'm sure it's unlikely <laughs> maybe <laughs> what about over here what kind of stuff have you, have you been doing this as well no or? i've not been doing that one that one was there before yeah, I that, came. Like well yeah that one's just sort of um trying to get things to grow taller so like you know oh, growing okay. upwards um lots of greenery that that that's basically just you know aesthetic Lots of flowers, yeah. looking very pretty. And so, when do you think they'll come out? Like, yeah, I was going to say, like, the problem is, is obviously it's like an art project, but it's not very immediate. Mm -hmm. So, like, for the next, maybe like it'll take about two years for like the whole of it to be, you know, yeah, what we what was imagined for it. But I suppose it's, it's more about like the actual process as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then. Definitely, for, like the project itself is definitely about the process of like building up, you know, and like for people to get involved and then be able to come back and see what they've done, how it's changed and stuff. So. So you said it was uh, people with learning disabilities, did you? Yeah, adults with learning disabilities. Right, yeah. and have they been involved in the actual gardening process? Yeah, or is yeah, it that yeah. You do it and then they can. No, I just happen to have like taken on this one bed for right. today, <laughs> but everything else like um, it's pretty much. I mean, there's Emily who runs it, who's running the project and kind of like designed it, I guess. But um, it's based on like getting people, with adults with learning disabilities, involved. Like they're all doing the planting, like the, the weeding, uh, been like watering, like you know they've just, uh, they've basically been doing the project and like they've right. just sort of, maybe it's not been designed by them but designed for them like to do. And do you think it's been successful, like have they enjoyed yeah, it a lot? Yeah and... definitely, definitely, I think so, maybe like they've all sort of gotten to meet new people and do something yeah, that maybe they wouldn't usually do. Yeah. So, and especially since it's in the summer so it's really nice for them to, for people to you know be able to get involved in gardening quite seasonal <laughs> so do you have uh, expertise in gardening yourself or are you just I wish I knew more than I do <laughs> <laughs> make it up as you go yeah on. I really am I'm doing sort of the basics I wish I knew like a do lot you just watch it. a copy of the secret garden <laughs> and go from there. I'm Probably inspired what I like, yeah exactly <laughs> like go on the you know the tv shows like country farm and stuff yeah. like that I'm like yep yeah, I wish yeah. that was me <laughs> <laughs> exactly. it goes all right. <laughs> but yeah no not at all I've learned I, I've learned a lot about gardening though yeah like from this project so it's been really good I think it's something that is really interesting to get to know more about as well, you know, because it's like, you know, also, th especially things with like herbs and vegetables, like growing your own mm. things, is, yeah. it would be really great to have an allotment. Yeah, it's know? very like stylish now, isn't it? Like the whole I grow your own kind of thing, <laughs> like yeah. trying to be as organic and as, you know, good for the environment as possible. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully, like, maybe, I don't know, maybe like the pro from this project, like others will sort of, you know, spring Develop. up. Yeah, maybe. I'm what, not sure. What do you do when you're not volunteering here then? Um, I'm, a, I'm a student. Um, I was back here for the for the summer, but like um, usually I'm, I go to a university, the Courtauld in London. So usually I'm there. So it's quite nice, especially to be like back out, like you know, in green spaces and stuff. It's quite yeah. different. To, well, involved. I usually I'm in, in in London, which is quite urban, and like you know, built up. So what do you yeah. study? 
history of art. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so is that how you got involved with the brief in the first place? Yeah, thing? basically, it's sort of, um, you know, trying to get a doing degree in, like, the arts is quite, like, you need to get lots of, you know, other things. Because so many people are doing art degrees, you've got to sort of, like, have other, you know, things to put in your CV or whatever. So it's kind of like, when I got back, I was like, right, to apply to the blue coat, get some volunteer work. <laughs> and, you know, luckily it worked out, so, and I've had a really good time, so that's really good. So, yeah. Are you an artist yourself? I was, and then decided, well, I was, like, in the sense of, you know, A-level art. Like, I wasn't an artist, like, I wouldn't have called myself that, but I decided between, like, doing practical art and, like, history of art and, like, theory and stuff and sort of chose to go down the academic route. Mm. So I kind of miss it every now and again. It's quite nice. That's why it's so nice getting back doing something practical because I've been so used to being, like, in libraries and things. Yeah. Because it's really, very different from, like, obviously doing, like, practical art itself so it's quite nice going back to working with my hands and things yeah yeah <laughs> so like what do you think you'd like to do with that degree like maybe a curator or yeah no a teacher? I when I first went into it curation was what sort of inspired me to do it but um it's really strange like I guess you change your mind a lot anyway whilst you're doing like your degree but mm. I've kind of gone off that idea much more sort of like working with the community and like developing art projects that involve people in art yeah sort of thing like the way that art can affect society and community and so like something like this maybe you know like creating programs to work with people and stuff yeah it's good that'd be nice yeah do you think you'll come back to liverpool um well yeah because um like i grew up in wigan so i've sort of always been between like liverpool and manchester like going in between so. yeah exactly <laughs> so you know I've always sort of got a basis here. It's really cool to be so close to like both cities because there's both so like so much going on in them. Yeah. Do you think they're quite like? Do you notice the similarities or the differences more? Well, different. Like, it's really funny. I've got a little sister, and because we're from Wigan, um, basically it's like same distance, Liverpool and Manchester. So I've got a little sister. On the weekends, I go to Manchester with my friends, and she goes to Liverpool with her friends. <laughs> so now I've got like my accent's quite neutral now because I've been at university. But my sister's got a real Scouse accent. <laughs> so when we used to go, when she came to visit me in in London, I'd you know have this Northern accent, quite broad and like Mancunian, and she had this Scouse accent. Everybody just didn't know what was going on because you know definitely so different. <laughs> yeah, they were like, no, you definitely come from different places. So that doesn't make any sense. But yeah. Um, so are we seeing shifting loyalties now that you're coming to Liverpool? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Going to Manchester it's now? like I never got the train to Liverpool before until like this <laughs> summer. So I was like, oh, I'm on your territory now. But yeah, I mean, there's different. I guess like Liverpool seems a lot smaller to me. Like mm. everything's sort of very much based in the middle, whilst Manchester you can kind of, I don't know, more spread out. Yeah. That's quite obvious. Might be something to do with it being a river, because often with like, you know, port cities where there's a river, it's more focused um, yeah, on the area, yeah, yeah, while Manchester's inland. Yeah, 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 definitely. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So do you think, I mean, do you want to stay in London, or, or do you think you'll come back to the northwest, or have you um, not decided yet? I don't know. I mean, when I'm there, I love it, but it's so, it's so expensive, yeah. which is like a real cough-out thing to say, but it's just so pricey, and the rent's so expensive. I don't really know how you do it without having, like, a student loan to fund yourself so um it'd be nice to but i think in reality i'm not sure yeah but no. then um i sort of like do the whole grass is always green and kind of thing because i'm like when i'm in london i'm like oh i want to be like you know surrounded by hills and green spaces and stuff but then when i'm there i just want to go back to yeah you know busy streets and stuff so i don't know where i'm gonna end up but yeah live a life in impoverished art <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, it's, very romantic. it's like exactly it's so romantic and then you're actually there and you're just like oh, oh no yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah so I don't 